Hi, and welcome to RBP on JSB. I'm violinist Rachel Barton Pine, and today we're going to be discussing the second movement of Bach's Partita No. 2 in D minor, the Courant. By the way, if you want to hear a discussion about some of the general issues that pertain to many of the movements of the sonatas and partitas, please be sure to watch the overview episode. So this Courant is very bouncy and boisterous and even playful. Um, it's really uh, such a fun, energetic movement. Um, interesting that he wrote it in 3-4 with triplets and not in 9-8. So I think that's indicating that this dotted rhythm should not be homogenized down to a triplety kind of thing. You know, it would be tempting to do... <laughs> that would lose some of the spunk that's built into this, the character of this movement. So um, should we overdot it? Should we make it exact sixteenths? I used to actually stress about that. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. And then later on I was like, why am I being that exact? I have to go for the feel of it. And surely Bach didn't mean for you to be as precise as rhythms like this would have been meant to be in later eras of music. So I don't know exactly what you would call what I do. It's not precisely an overdot. It's just something that sounds right and feels good. And of course, some of them are joined together. And so it's not always because you don't want it to be beat, 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 everything equal. Um, you want to have some different, more important beats, less important beats, however the flow of the music is going along. And you could actually practice this separate bow idea by doing a scale. to A. So you can get some notes on all the strings. Something like that, just to give yourself a warm-up, because hooked bows would lose so much of the character. Huh? Or a, you know, sort of um, Viati era, up, down, up, down, up. They hadn't invented that yet in 1720. I guess you could make it sound dancey, but it, it just wouldn't sound courant like. Uh, you've got to have the bow be more dancing for this dance movement. Yeah, that just feels so much more satisfying. Um, interestingly, there are a couple of long notes at the end, which are the only notes. Um, in the body of the first or second half that are longer than a quarter. And I'm talking, of course, about measure 50 and 51, which are actually, in a way, um, kind of a tag. So after you have... Um, he could have ended things right there. Instead of... Um, and there's your real ending. So these two bars, 50 and 51, are very rhetorical. Dum -ba -da. The harmony is trying to find itself. Da -da 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 -da. And then onwards to the end. So I would make more of taking time in those two bars and not so much in the, at the end with some big lugubrious retard. That's a little too indulgent, so. I don't even know what chord that is. That's an interesting one, whatever it is. Then your diminished chord, and then back to D minor with a little A major 5 chord. And there you are. So that's a very special moment to really play with as regards timing. Speaking of bowings, what should we do about these single eighths followed by eight more eighths? Um, it's tempting to want to kind of hook them in too. Or maybe But what if Bach really meant it? I mean he was a violinist after all and a pretty darn good one. So
Well, the argument might be, well, it makes those down bows stick out. Well, maybe that was the point. <laughs> maybe he wanted them to go, ya da 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 Actually, if you decide that you are, you know, that you mean to do that and go with it, it gives it a lot of nice impetus. And then, you know, measure 15 with your nice um, harmony there. And there he did tie it into the next note. So you know what? If he'd wanted those slurs to be longer than they are, he would have written them longer. Having tenutos on those first notes is actually a really nice thing. Let's check out measure 31 real quick. Here we have these littler sections. One, three, one, three, one. Now we're stuck on an up bow, so here I do take another up, you know, let's break my own rule. Then down, then down. So just taking a little more time on those notes um, gives it a nice feel. It doesn't have to be bound to the metronome as long as the big beats, um, you know, measure by measure, as long as that's steady. It can have a little bit of ebb and flow um, within the measure and I, it actually gives it a little bit more life as far as creating the spirit of the dance. Measure 22 we get a little bit backwards if we stay with the as it comes approach. Let's see, let's go all the way back to measure 16 where we were on a down bow coming out of measure 15. Let's hook that in and then or slur it in as indicated and then there's a little bit of polyphony by the way. Lower voice, upper voice, lower voice, upper voice, upper voice still and then lower voice. And then here, if it's as it comes, it's backwards a bit, but it all works out in the end. So just do what it says and it feels just fine. And by the way, the three notes right before the last note are a slur in the first half. And in the second half, they are not. And that actually, I think, is the only time he has a triplet that doesn't have a slur. So was it the one time he forgot to write one in? Well, that's people's automatic assumption. A little mistake. Bach was not completely devoid of them. He was human. Um, but maybe the fact that it's the very last triplet of the whole movement, maybe it's not a mistake. Maybe Bach wanted just at the end there for a little bit more oomph going into the final note. <laughs> It does make logical sense. So when in doubt, play what he wrote, or in that, in this case, what he didn't write. Don't play what he didn't write. The opposite way of saying it. Oh, there's one other place where you do need to double up, and that is measure 43. After, then you probably need to take another up bow here. Then we have two bar phrases. One, two. And then another one. And there it comes out down bow and it all works if you take that, that second up at the end of 43. So one of the challenges of this movement is string crosses, crossing over multiple strings. So we have it right at the beginning in a slur, unless you go to third position, but that's a sort of romantic era thing to do that you might not want to do. <laughs> And then you have a shift, which is also not the easiest thing in the world. So better to just stay in first and you can avoid knocking the D like I just did on purpose to show you, I promise, um, by kind of rolling your bow over and kind of faking a slur, making sure that the C sharp is played in such a way that it rings. See, that sounded like a slur. Um, and you can actually make one of those, those um, pretend slurs and make it sound entirely realistic, even jumping across a string. There are plenty of other places where it's not within a slur, but other places you have to be aware of going across strings and not bumping other strings between 9 and 10. And of course, measure 17. 
between that note back and forth, and then measure 22, and then measure 26 here, measure 28. There's a number more throughout the movement, and I'm not going to tell all of them to you because you can be a detective and find them for yourself. But just try to find them all, even Xerox an extra copy of just this movement, and then take a red pen and write a slash mark between every two notes where, you know, you have one, um, you know, the slash mark in between where you have to skip over a string. So, and then isolate just those spots and practice them extra to hopefully get rid of any accidental bumpings of strings. A few nice harmony moments that I should definitely point out. Um, there's an F major thing going on. Um, it, well, it re ultimately resolves to F major, I should say, by the beginning of measure 12. Um, so after starting in minor key, then it kind of starts to work its way towards major, pretty obviously. <laughs> and I won't even bother to analyze what chord is what. You can just hear that it's chords that are moving towards something. None of them are arrival chords. They're just a, a sequence of chord changes that's clearly heading towards major key. So as it's heading towards major key, change your sound so that you're not the same intensity as you were here. You don't want to sound the same. That just doesn't make any kind of sense. F major, a little bit happier, right? A little more chilled out, a little more relaxed, and then of course it gets intense again. Then we have another major moment, um, major key moment, that measures 28 and 29. Um, just, But this is really just a little tiny um, veering off the minor key path and then it goes right back to it. So, so we have our D minor in measure 27 and then little uh, momentary B flat major. But then that doesn't last for long. Then we have a really cool harmony here. The D, um, D7. And then ultimately we go to, so we're in G minor and we kind of, you know, work our way through a sequence and we end up in a G minor cadence um, in 36. So we should take some time and really let that be a moment of breathing before barreling on ahead. And then a little F major, but doesn't last long. So um, let's see, then there are of course some stronger notes like um, the harmony right on the downbeat of 15. Then resolve, then another strong one less strong. So often it's, you know, strong, less strong, stronger, less strong as these things go along. So there are a number of places where just listening for the keys, you don't have to, you know, this is not theory class, you don't have to actually write down what the chord is um, or call it its correct name. Um, but knowing what it does, that's what's important. This is applied theory, theory that's going, that's going to guide your interpretation and ultimately impact what you do on stage, what you're presenting to the audience. So knowing what chords are intense or what chords are leading to other chords and all of that stuff, not just thinking in terms of notes, but thinking in terms of harmony as you're going through. But sometimes we do have to think about notes and one note that is um, the worst one in the whole movement in terms of nailing it is measure 48. And so I actually have a little solution for that that I came up with a number of years ago, which is to get into um, third position early instead of and then trying to leap for it. Of course, you could shift to third position there, but then you've got a yucky slide in the middle of a triplet. So I stay in first position and then I shift here. bit of an unusual shift, but it's totally possible. It's just not what we normally do, but it's nice and clean and kind of hidden. And then my four is already on the string. Then I just put down my two and then my three and I'm good to go. I went from nailing it some of the time with my old fingering, which was the jump, to nailing it 
most of the time, if not every time, once I did that new fingering. So hopefully that'll work for you too. Well, those are some of my thoughts about the D minor current. I'm Rachel Barton Pine, and thank you for watching RBP on JSB.